Thank you, Lisa. And this is the first meeting we've had where we're recording. And you may have noticed it on one of the slides that uh, from now on, if the speaker says it's okay, we'll record it. Those who are members can listen. If you miss the meeting, you can listen. Uh, the first 30 days, the recording will be available for members only. And after that, it'll be available on our website uh, for anybody. So that's a, that's a good thing. Uh, and John, of course, has said that's fine. So we are recording. And, you know, over the years, we've had a pretty good collection of speakers from, from the, the local area around here. And we have two good speakers coming up in March and April who are from Seattle. But the benefit of the Zoom technology is uh, we're not limited to speakers from the Seattle area. And you may recall last year we heard Sean Fraga speak from New York and then Carl Thrush from Victoria. And now we get to welcome John Putnam, who's speaking to us from San Diego. John's been a history professor at California State University at San Diego since 2000, and he's also the associate dean for the College of Arts and Letters down there. He's a man of many talents. Last year, he finished a six-year term as also director of the university's international business program. Pretty good for a historian. Yeah. John's specialty is the late 19th and 20th century in the history of the American West, particularly California and the Pacific Coast states. And we invited him to speak tonight because he, we heard about his latest book, which is Boosting a New West Pacific Coast Expositions, 1905 to 1916. Those of you who are observant will notice off my left shoulder, the, the, there's the book. Now I'm uh, from a long line of book people and my father taught me long ago that if you receive a book, you should thank the person immediately. Because if you, if you read it and you don't like it or you don't read it at all, you're off the hook because you've already sent your thanks. <laughs> That's always a good rule to follow. And early on, I mentioned to John that I'd purchased the book and that could be saying enough. I wouldn't have to say any more. Mm -hmm. But I'm happy to report that it's a very well-researched and enjoyable read. And I highly recommend it to anyone interested in the Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition and all the other fairs of that time. When I talked to John originally, I, I said, you know, your book covers all these world's fairs. Maybe you should concentrate on the AYPE. And then I looked at the book and I sent him an email and I said, I take it all back. We don't <laughs> want to have it that limited. I also recommend reading John's first book which is Class and Gender Politics in Progressive Area Seattle, which was published in 1908. And that is also off my left shoulder. In that he explores class and gender politics in the urban Northwest. And I think it's a must read for people like me who are interested in the history of women's suffrage in our region. So one can learn a lot from John Putnam and we're glad he was available to spend time with us tonight. And so with that, John, uh, I, I give the Zoom podium to you. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me. Uh, it's great to be hanging around with other historians. As Jim said, I'm now an associate dean, so kind of moved to the dark side a little bit more. Um, but um, so what I thought I'd do today is uh, tell you a little bit about the book in case you have not. Obviously, many people have not yet read it or have, will never read it, but my wife has never read it. So, uh, you know, that tells you a lot. She hasn't read my first book either, too. So I'm not sure what that says, but uh, um so I, mean, I thought I'd tell you a little about how the, uh, how the book came around, uh, you know, focus on, you know, what I was attempting to do in this and talk a little about some of my findings in that. And of course, I do welcome any questions uh, at the end. Um, so as Jim said, uh, this book actually came out of my research for my first book, which actually came out of my dissertation. Uh, you know, uh, Seattle is probably my second favorite city. I have family up there. I go up there a lot. Um, and so uh, what this came about was I was doing the research and writing for the book and I came across the Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition. Now I'd never heard of it. I didn't know that much about Seattle when I started my research in, in graduate school. So um, I kind of put it aside. I thought it was very interesting because I had actually noticed some of the labor parts. I was doing labor history at the time and how workers were opposed to the AYP for a while because of they weren't using union workers and that. And I, of course, coming from San Diego, I had no know, know about the uh, Pacific California Exposition here, because like Washington, um, San Diego kept its buildings, at least, and even more of their buildings. In fact, most of Balboa Park, our, where our museums are located, all those were the original, most of them were the original exposition buildings. Um, um, you know, San Francisco tore down almost all of its, Guild Lake was filled in. And so uh, it's nice to see that some of the buildings did continue. 
so uh, what happened then is I was finishing that first book. I decided to think, you know, I want to I want to go back and look at these expositions because I they were fascinating events, as many of you know. Um, and what drove me to them was what they could tell us about the American West um, and how Westerners see themselves in their region. Uh, and so that was the uh, question that I wanted to address in my initial research. So I began um, uh, actually with Portland uh, because I had got a fellowship and I was still finishing my first book. So I took five weeks off in the summer, went to Portland. And I'll tell you, Portland has the best set of records for an exposition on the Pacific coast. Um, they even had, uh, you know, the, literally the boxes full of the secretary's records with all the letters they received. Um, you know, a lot of the other ones have brochures and things like that, and a, a few reports here and there, but this was very rich. Um, and so as this uh, blossomed, uh, I had two things I had to figure out. One um, was, again, the angle I was going to take. So originally it was, what this can tell us about Westerners? because ultimately these are boosting opportunities for the uh, inhabitants of these four cities. They're selling their city to outsiders um, for money, to bring new tourists, to bring capital uh, investment, so on and so forth. So obviously they are going to sell something about their city to entice people to come to these fairs. Uh, and the second thing was which of the four fairs I was gonna look at. Um, and I quickly realized that, you know, there had already been books on each of the separate fairs, probably multiple books and dissertations and theses. Um, I thought it would be good to see them in a, in a collection. Uh, Robert Rydell, of course, has done his famous book that looked at a multiple number. In fact, this was the last four he looks at, um, but he looked at at least five or six other, or five others um, focused on the idea of empire. But I wanted to, uh, I thought this could tell us focus more on the West. So, um, the only thing I had to really come down to decide at the last minute was whether it's going to include San Francisco or not. Because um, San Francisco is really different than the other three cities. I mean, it's an established city. It's a cosmopolitan city. It's the fifth largest city in the country, turn of the century. So it doesn't need the fair as much as, let's say, Seattle, Portland, and San, and San Diego did. Um, but I thought that, you know, there was enough there from the San Francisco fair that would help confirm some of the things I was trying to do uh, when I was looking at San Diego. All right, so really what this book does is, um, before I get into talking about the images of the West, um, the other main thing I did was, and this came actually from, admittedly, from uh, one of my readers um, in my first uh, effort to get it published, and he said, you know, you know, you really should push the marketing part of your book more, because I had, it was a kind of a side part, and so uh, I looked back at it again and I agreed, um, which meant I had to spend another six months doing research on advertising um, at the turn of the century. And so my book starts off with just the, you know, a brief description of the four um, expositions, how they came about, you know, and, and again, they've actually built off each other. The Portland one started uh, as a brainchild um, of a businessman in Portland, mid 1890s. Um, who saw a stagnant, you know, during the depression, 1890s, a stagnant Portland. And, you know, we need to do something to kind of bring more business to Portland and growth. Um, and as that one took off in, in, in 1905, Seattle was watching what was going on. Of course, they were coming down, their business leaders were coming down to participate and, and visit the fair. And they realized, hey, they could do the same thing. Um, uh, what they decided to do, of course, was a little bit different, was focus on the Yukon and Alaska territories. Because as you guys all know, you know that, that you're almost six or seven years into the gold rush, um, which had transformed Seattle, you know, triples the population in the first 10 years, the first decade of the 20, uh, 20th century. Um, but they also realized that was coming to an end soon. Um, and what was going to be kind of the next stage for Seattle. But also, of course, the gold rush led to a very transient population. There were people coming and going, nobody was staying long. Um, and so uh, they decided to boldly and baldly basically say, hey, this is about selling this, pre this region. Uh, they didn't even connect it to a historical event or a cultural event or anything like um, the Lewis and Clark uh, exhibition, excuse me, the Lewis and Clark trip westward um, that the uh, Portland Fair had done. Um, and then as 
Seattle was finishing its, San Diego, 1910, uh, began to think about putting one on. Uh, San Diego was interesting because it was the smallest city of the four. It only had 40,000 people in 1910. Um, and it's remarkable they were actually able to put on this event. Um, and what, of course, they wanted to emphasize was the uh, impending completion of the Panama Canal, uh, which uh, they believed was going to transform the United States. Um, it would really make the U U.S. a Pacific Coast nation, in a sense, draw people away from it, the Atlantic. Um, and what made San Diego unique, uh, very good for this was it's the first port north of the, uh, of the Panama Canal in the United States. And San Diego has a very nice, uh, very large port, a uh, natural port. Um, unfortunately for them, San Francisco uh, decided it wanted to also host a exhibition. exposition. Um, and San, for San Franciscans, they were trying to rebound from the earthquake of two, 1906, which of course has devastated the city. Um, and they wanted to showcase that the city had, you know, revived itself. It, it had been revived. Um, and the, what happens here is that the two cities begin to vie for it um, in 19, for the 1915 ex, uh, exposition. And both are trying to get the, they, they want to get the United States to support them, the U.S. government. The problem they faced was, um, you know, they, nobody thought they could have two in the, in the same year. Um, and then New Orleans came into the picture uh, and said, well, they put in a bid to hold the exposition instead in 1915. Um, and this forced really leaders of California to, to, to focus behind one of them. And of course they picked San Francisco. It was the bigger city, the more powerful city, the dominant city in California and the entire Pacific coast. Um, and San Diego had to quickly pivot into this very regional, um, but very unique uh, fair. So, um, so that's where I start the book. And then I spend a, a chapter talking about advertising. Um, and what I attempt to do here is to help uh, you know, the reader see how advertising was changing. Because again, if you're boosting these events, one thing you do is you need to advertise and market your communities or region to people who don't know anything about it or know very little bit about it, um, who live many miles away, usually on the other side of the Rockies, all the way to the East Coast. And um, what was happening in advertising, it was undergoing its own transformation. Um, advertising was becoming professionalized uh, by the turn of the century. Um, and what it was attempting to do as it professionalized was to kind of move away from the shucksterism of advertising of the late 19th century. You know, the patent medicines that promise to solve all your ails. I mean, there's a famous one, the uh, Hostetters, Stomach Bitters, uh, around the turn of the century was promoting this, uh, that their medicine could solve virtually anything to do with your digestive tract, from an ulcer to just indigestion. Um, of course, we later learned that uh, it was also like 60% alcohol, so you probably didn't feel anything uh, as you were taking it. But again, they were these wild claims that these medicines and other things would you know, change your life and solve your life. And of course they didn't do that. And it made the industry look bad. So what advertisers, as they professionalized, moved away from this uh, into um, what they would call reason why, uh, was the name given to it, uh, advertising. And basically the idea was to try to create and help the consumer see kind of a reason why they would want this product. Um, and what's happening in the industry writ large is the industry advertising is becoming more and more important because we are becoming a more developed economy that is moving away from just its industrial base and the next phase is consumerism. Now, the problem American businessmen faced was that 19th century culture generally celebrated thriftiness not spending money, living within your own means. But as we all know, we cannot survive as a country that way. You know, we need to buy stuff to keep our country afloat. Still, 70% of our economy is our consumerism. And so how do you then get people to buy your product if they don't necessarily need it? Um, so one of the things that happens in advertising is a movement to um, create the need for the product. Um, so rather than, because you could sell any product and simply say, here's its function. 
Uh, and you know, pair of pants covers your legs, keeps your coat, keeps you warm. Um, one of the examples I use often when I teach is, is Listerine. Uh, Listerine by the early 20th century was becoming a very popular product. Um, and what Listerine was doing in its ads, and if you go to the national magazines, uh, you know, Saturday Evening Post and things like that, in the teens and 20s, you start to see these. Rather than just have a, a full page ad they would have in an in a, in a article, and rather than just be a couple of bullet points with big bold lettering, they'd have these multiple paragraphs of story. And so what they did here was that Listerine, which simply takes care of halitosis, bad breath, um, that's its function. Um, that's the way they used to advertise it. Here's it's what it does. Now what they were doing was creating these elaborate stories around this Listerine. And so in one of them, one of the famous ones, this young woman who used to have all the dates she wanted is now single and unhappy because no man wants to go out with her and she can't figure out why. And the story goes on and says, well, the reason why is she's got bad breath. And so once she took Listerine, boom, her life changed. Now she was loved and she could pick any man she wanted and she was happy and contented, so on and so forth. So the message then was, you know, it's not just Lister Listerine is doing more than just solving your bad breath. It is getting you a date and making your life better. So this is what advertisers have to do. The one thing they had to run into though, was when you advertise in a place, it's a little bit more complicated. Um, there are several, there are numerous scholars who study place promotion, they call it, basically promoting places. Um, and because one of the problems you run into is how do you measure success? Well, you know, with a product, you know, sales go up, success. Um, but with, you know, you're selling a city, a community, a lot, and you really, you're selling a lifestyle or some kind of experience, that's a little bit more problematic. And, you know, even if people, are going to move to that place, it doesn't mean they move tomorrow. Maybe it's two or three, four years down the line, down the way before they make decisions. You know, I wanna get out of this town I'm living in in Pittsburgh and I wanna move west and hey, I remember Seattle. Uh, I went to that fair. So it's really hard to connect the dots between the sales pitch in a sense and that. All right, so the other thing I look at in the, in the advertising is what kind of advertising is going on. And one of the things you see in these expositions is the exploitation director, and that's what they call the publicity departments. Almost all of them are newspaper men, and again, they're all men uh, for the most part. There are interesting in these is I didn't really get into gender as much, of course, certainly coming out from my other book, you think I would have. Um, there, of course, were women's societies that participated in the fairs and that. But when you look at the larger promotion of it, it tend to be mostly again, white men, business leaders of the community. Um, and most of them were uh, print men or in advertising themselves. Uh, and that's why they were chosen to lead the effort. Um, and there's a couple things I'll mention before I move on to the actual bulk of the book. Um, most of the advertising they attempted to do was using newspapers and magazines first and foremost, because that was the, mo the dominant uh, media at the time. Um, but they couldn't afford ads. Ads were expensive. And so, uh, and these magazines would not promote or in a sense publish ads for free. So how are you gonna sell the Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition? Well, what they would then do is write up stories about Seattle, about Washington, about what was going on at the fairgrounds as it was being built and provide those free to the magazines and the newspapers. And obviously magazines and newspapers need content too. So they provided the content and they would publish these things. And you can go back and look at those magazines of the turn of the century. So there's dozens and dozens and dozens of articles. And it's interesting, a lot of them are the same or very similar. You know, they kind of repackage stuff over and over and then reinvent the wheel. Um, but this was a very important part of getting it because they needed to get the message to consumers and others thousands of miles away. And how else can you do it? Um, the other main source of advertising um, was the railroads. Uh, the railroads were a natural uh, ally of the fairs. All the fairs had good relationships with the local railroad, with the railroads, the transcontinentals, because the railroads needed people to travel on their trans transcontinentals, and the fairs needed people to attend. So it made a natural relationship. So once these communities decided to consider hosting fairs, usually the railroads jumped in with support, money, 
Uh, they provided, uh, they, they, they put the advertising in their guidebooks and other kinds of things uh, that you would have if you went to a railroad uh, station out east and I say uh, Philadelphia, you could see an ad for the Union Pacific and you, or the Central Southern Pacific or the, uh, the Santa Fe Railroad, and it would be in there something about the fair that was going on that year. The other thing that they did was they used railroad agents, you know, the ones who worked the offices and book trips or were often uh, perhaps even those that were, you know, um, working on the railroads. Um, they were very important because they could help convince people too. here's why you want to go to Seattle where you want to go to Portland, take that trip. Um, and the last thing I'll mention about the railroads is they needed to make sure in order to ensure that people would want to go all the way across the country to some town that may have heard little about for a exposition they didn't know much about, you know, other than a few articles they had read, is they also reminded them that, hey, on the way, you can stop by Yellowstone uh, or on the way back. And Yellowstone was, of course, a very popular destination. If you took the Southern route, it's the Grand Canyon. And everybody knew in America about those two places and wanted to see them. They were being, you know, these are the natural wonders of the United States. And so these would help the railroads entice people to make that trip across to make it look like it was not only meaningful, but useful for them financially. Um, so the book itself then really gets into two, two sections. I have a section on the Pacific Northwest and I look at uh, three chapters, which I'll go over in just a second, and then three chapters on a similar themes for the Southwest, as I call it, basically the two California expositions. So the chapters in the Pacific Northwest start off with you know, the selling of the promise. What is the promise that they're selling to these, uh, these people back East in the Midwest? Um, and I do start off with the idea that one of the things they had to deal with was not only to say, what is it about our community, our region, that people would want to come here for? So part of you sell the advantages, the positives. At the same time though, however, they also have to dispel the negative stereotypes that most Americans harbored about the far West and the West in general. Um, you know, you know, the West of course was still mythic to many people. Um, again, we're only 20, 25 years following the end of the Plains Indian Wars. Um, but if you were an American living around the turn of the century, you would think those wars were still ongoing because if you picked up a dime novel, um, which were very popular in the late 19th century because Part of industrialization was industrializing print and publications. Um, for a dime, you could get these cheap novels with these uh, fantastic stories about like, guys like Buffalo Bill Cody out there, you know, and they always focused on the savage Indian and how Buffalo Bill Cody defeated them or you know, saved the white woman, so on and so forth. Um, or they were stories about guys who escaped the East and then became train robbers and everything else. Um, and so you have to understand again that a lot of people would not have uh, a sophisticated knowledge of the far west. Um, San Francisco, they might know a little bit more about, but the other three communities were, were much well less known. And so this is leading, leaving this image of that the west is still this wild and woolly west. Then on top of that, you have the Wild West shows, um, Buffalo Bill Cody's Wild West and you know, Congress of Rough Riders, you see from the print there, one of the most famous. Um, and of course he started a whole industry because by the turn of the century, there are dozen at least that I know of, of similar Wild West shows being put on packaged by different individuals. There's one in Seattle that's gonna be during the fair, in Portland, San Diego has one. Um, but Buffalo Bill Cody, what he did in his Wild West shows was bring really somewhat a lot of the dime novel content that was two was two dimensional to make it three dimensional. So you could now physically and visually see the conquest of the American West. You could go out there and you would the shows would start off with gun battles and, and shooting exhibitions, um, followed by good riding of horses. Um, and then you would have buffalo, real buffalo that you could go up and touch afterwards. Um, but the, the essential part of the show were the spectacles, as they were called. And these were shows that, uh, you know, that celebrated or, or commemorated major events in, in, the, in the West. Custer's Last Stand, 
Um, that one was actually not very popular because Custer, of course, loses. We, you know, wanted to see that. But in later um, shows, Buffalo Bill Cody, for example, had one where he rides in in the middle. Again, these are in giant circus tents like. And he rides in and there's a white woman stuck to a, a tied to a post and she's got the, you know, the Indian squaws as they were called in the book or, and at the time poking at her. He rides in, swoops in, grabs her, puts her on the horse and saves her. Um, so when people left these shows, what he was doing was taking a version of the West, which, you know, was already stereotyped and warped, but making it much more realistic to people, more authentic. And one of the reasons why is not only because you could you could see it in your own your two eyes, but you could smell the gun smoke. You could touch the woolly, you know, you know, fur of the buffalo. And um, he wanted authenticity, so he brought in Native Americans from the reservations, including Sitting Bull, for a while, to portray various Native Americans. Um, and so I actually went and looked at some of the newspapers in New York and New York Times, and they would still have these references to the, the, the understanding that the West was this way. So this is one of the things they had to do was dispel this. Um, I already talked about Buffalo Bill Cody, so let me skip over here. So one of the things that they had to deal with then was um, in order to convince Americans that the West was worthy of settlement and, and coming moving here, and, you know, that's expensive and not easy, or even to visit as a tourist, was that the West was not dangerous anymore. It was not, you weren't threat, your life wouldn't be threatened. But at the same time, they also understood that that exotic nature of those Indian stories um, was very attractive to people. And so ironically, what ended up happening is often these advertisers, these business boosters, they would undermine their own messaging because they were trying to say, well, we're not this, we're not this, we're not this, but they would have an Indian, uh, a Wild West show just in case, you know, keep people, because people wanted to come. Because ultimately, these expositions are, are capitalist adventures. They, the businessmen have put in money, and they don't want to lose the money. They'll break even is okay, but they don't want to lose money. So they must get people to come. And so they realize that outside, this is what's going to attract them. Promises of seeing Native Americans in their, quote, natural settings in some ways, or experience the, the West as it was understood at that time. So as we enter in then into um, uh, what I then begin to look at as I go through these various uh, expositions, again, is to try to understand um, uh, what are they selling? And so one of the things that in particular they're trying to sell here is economic opportunity. Because the context, of course, of turn of the century America is while we're in the midst of a fantastic industrialization and urban growth, it of course comes with negative consequences comes with growing poverty, you know, crime, uh, filth in the cities, they're overburdened in that, um, they're full of smoke and, and uh, you know, and soot, and teeming with all these, quote, new immigrants who are dangerous and under threatening the, the nature of the country. Um, and so one of the things they're attempting to then do is to say, look, if you come west, you come to Portland, you come to Seattle or San Diego in that matter, there are economic opportunities for you. Um, and one of the things they sold, both in the North and the South, of the, on the, in the Pacific Coast, was agriculture, interestingly enough. Because at the turn of the century, um, Teddy Roosevelt had uh, commissioned a group to study the countryside. It was called the Countryside Commission. And around 1909, they released their report after years of study. And the reason why he commissioned this group was there was growing concerns of the rapid outmigration from rural areas to cities. And what are the consequences of that? Um, why were the kids not wanting to stay back and become farmers like mom and dad, but wanted to get to the city? Um, and so again, they identified some of the basic problems, you know, it was isolating, it was hard work. You're, you know, you're so far away from your neighbors because again, farms tend to be very large, four or five, 600 acres and they're larger, at least the successful ones. Um, it's isolating. And so uh, for the youth, it wasn't exciting either. You have the exciting new cities like New York and Boston and that moving around and, and San Francisco for that matter. So in the end, um, uh, they, one of the conclusions 
is that um, they need they need to promote the fact that out west you can return to the farm, you can return to the land, uh, and um, I'll mention when I talk about San Diego in just a minute. One of the things they uh, tried to do was talk about the fact that you could come out to Seattle, and you could have a farm, and it didn't have to be 500 acres. You could farm out here with some irrigation uh, helping you out, and you could now uh, produce a crop that would allow you to have more density, living density, which means your neighbors are closer, and therefore there's going to be a local village or little town to service all those people, and you have all the amenities of you know modern life you know, but you still get the fresh air of living out in the farmlands and that. Um, and so they would advertise in all their guidebooks and that, this, the, the sums of land that were available, millions of uh, untouched acreage. Um, you know, of course, they had already pushed the Native Americans onto the reservations, and so they had opened up lots of land. So economic opportunity was one of the keys then they tried to sell, um, both in North and in the South, in, in the Southern ones. In fact, in San Diego, they went, took it to a new level. They put together in Balboa Park, right where our, Zan, our zoo is actually, it's our zoo parking lot now, would be the um, model farm. And it was a kind of model farm showing that you could be successful on a farm of modest five to 10 acres. Uh, it had a, I think it had a three acre orchard, you know, with some oranges and lemons, a little farm. It had a bungalow house, the modern bungalow which they would take wives through to show them all the amenities. And the idea that San Diegans were selling was that this could be your future. You don't need to live in industrial cities. You can come out West, have a seven or eight park or park, uh, acre farm, make a good living. And therefore you could um, uh, have the density, the best of both the urban and rural lifestyle. So that was really what they were selling. And one of them, both of my, I have two chapters, one for the North and one for the Southern, uh, fairs, looking at how landscape then was used. You know, uh, part of it is selling the landscape, selling the land itself. But one of the interesting things they also, of course, did was sell the natural landscape that surrounded these communities, um, emphasizing that, you know, from Seattle, as I learned when I went there to do my research and was surprised once the clouds cleared one day and I was at my motel uh, doing research, I looked up and I saw Mount Rainier, first time I'd ever seen it. And two weeks I was there, uh, my first trip. You have this, these beautiful mountains. You got Mount Hood, San Diego. You've got these beaches. Um, you've got, you know, right now we have snow in our mountains. You know, I'm, you know 15, 20 miles from me. Um, so uh, this was another thing they attempted to sell that the West was not just uh, empty land. It was beautiful land too, healthy, and so they promoted the climates. Um, Pacific Northwest cities would, you know, were known for their rain, as of course are still to this point. But they would publish in their brochures in that average rain years, uh, rainfall per year, and would show that actually Portland had less rain per year than New York City did, um, by, by several inches actually. Um, it's just that it tended to be spread out over a longer period of time than it was in New York City, where it came in, you know, a few months. But the idea here was these climates were good for health because there's a real health kick in America at the turn of the century. I mean, it's one of the anxieties of living in urban America at this time. Uh, the playground movement uh, took off in uh, these communities out in the East. And so what Americans out West do is they focus on, hey, we have natural playgrounds. You don't need to have this artificial playground built in the middle of your concrete jungle. You can take a trip to Mount Hood here in Portland and get that nice fresh air and good exercise. So I look at that and I also talk, of course, about the importance of irrigation as part of this story. Um, that irrigation was really the key here. And in San Diego, um, uh, William Smythe, or Smith, you know how you want to pronounce it, he was the dean, in essence, of all uh, irrigation, wrote the famous Conquest of Ar Arid America in 1898. He had his own place down here in car near the border called Little Landers, where he was putting that into action. They lived in this little commune. Uh, with um, uh, small farms that were somewhat successful, though eventually it fell apart. Um, but the community was trying to emphasize that you didn't need large farms because irrigation allowed you to um, grow more lucrative crops. You didn't need to grow thousand acres of wheat to make a few bucks. 
Just do some almonds or do some peaches or oranges, strawberries, much more valuable per acre than any wheat is per acre. Um, and before I stop here, let me just say the last sections of, the, of both those sections of chapters focus, of course, on the issue of race. Um, because one of the features of the American West, of course, is its diversity, much more diverse than the East is at this time. Um, and Americans knew that. They had read about Native Americans, of course, for decades and watched the Buffalo Bill shows. But one of the features of these fairs, because they, lied on the, they lay in the Pacific, was the economic opportunity they were selling was connection to the Asian markets. This is why the Pacific was going to be the future, that was going to be the 21st century, would be the Pacific America, not Atlantic America, because all the future growth and economic activity was going to be on the Pacific. And who's best there than Seattle, which is the closest to any of them, Portland next, you know, San Francisco, the biggest city with all the connections to world trade. Now, what that, of course, does then, when you open up the Pacific, it also, also brings in different kinds of peoples that may not inhabit the eastern half of the country. Um, and so, as I mentioned, I, I talk a lot, a lot about Native Americans because there's this, this, this they're trying to try to strike this balance between appealing to the exotic desires of these consumers who want to come out and see Native Americans, want to see Indians as they read about them. But they also don't want to think about the West as is, is, is overwhelmed by them and endangered by them. And so at these fairs, they would have Native Americans in their, quote, natural settings. San Diego put on a massive village of 300 Native Americans. Interestingly, none from San Diego County. They went and got them from New Mexico um, and had them in their supposed natural setting, doing their natural things, making cloth and so on and so forth. Um, and what they were attempting to show then also was that there was this, that they had in a sense been tamed. They were not a threat. Um, and they were not gonna, you were not gonna be endangered if you lived in Portland or Seattle by Native Americans at all. Um, they were on the process of assimilation. I mean, uh, Seattle held its massive um, Congress of Indian educators who came together and had all these papers and, 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 and talked about how much education was changing and transforming Native Americans. And they're on their way to full assimilation kind of thing. Then you had, of course, um, the Chinese and Japanese populations in particular on the West Coast. Um, these were well, let, much well less known to those that didn't live on the West Coast. And um, if you're going to tie into this Pacific empire, you're going, it's a two way street. Yes, you can sell goods there and people can go there, but they're gonna come here too. Um, and of course you have sizable Asian American populations throughout on the coast um, ever since the gold rush in the 1850s. Um, and so again, how do you deal with them uh, for people who are not familiar with them and have all these hold, harbor all these stereotypes. Um, and sometimes they play to those stereotypes. San Diego was just did, did it because what ended up happening was China uh, up until the 1950 before the 1915 exposition was still not had not become a con through its revolution its nat nationalism uh, and did not participate much at the two uh, Pacific Northwest fairs. Uh, in fact, in Seattle, it was um, a local businessman who had to go to China and bring stuff back to put on a kind of Chinese village-like thing in, at the AYP. Um, and, uh, but in San, but in, in, in San Francisco, the Chinese played a much larger role. And um, they wanted to make sure that they were, them, they were portrayed in a more positive light. Um, San Diego didn't get a lot of Chinese support, so they said, well, forget that then, we're just going to sell this more exotic, uh, you know, alluring kind of imagery. So they had the underground Chinatown, which is basically an opium den filled with slave girls. Um, and you go in and you get to participate and see all this, you know, kind of go to everybody's baser instincts. So this is what was going on uh, with that. Um, the Japanese was more problematic because the Japanese, you know, they had become a world power after defeating Russia in 1905. Um, and demanded certain things. The problem that fair directors faced was there was a, a, a lot of anti-Asian sentiment on the West Coast. Um, when Seattle hosted its 
um, it was really one of the centers of anti-Asian labor sentiment. You know, um, the Exclusion League had a very po powerful uh, group up there in Seattle. Um, and they, were, they didn't want anything to do with Asian Ameri a these Asian Americans or Asians coming in in particular. Um, but the directors and the producers of the things needed them because they were trying to showcase these are our future trading partners. This is who is going to bring us all this wealth. We don't want to offend them either. Um, so this, this complicated things. Uh, and the last group I mentioned are the Filipinos. Um, and when the first exposition takes place in 1905, we're at the tail end of, you know, the, uh, the Spanish American War is over, of course, but the conquest of the Philippines. And so the United States has now acquired a territory, a colonial, a former colonial holder, you know, the colonies of England are now colonial oppressors themselves in some ways. Um, and how do you deal with that? Well, part of it is you say, well, they need us. And one way to demonstrate that was to show Filipinos to the American public. And what they did was they took the most exotic, primitive-like version of the Filipinos, um, who are a very diverse population, and brought them here as a live exhibit. They had done it in St. Louis in 1904 at the St. Louis Exposition, and now they were attempting to do it here. And in the end, um, uh, they put them on uh, the Igorot village, where they had, they were dressed in loincloths um, and they supposedly ate dogs and there were newspaper comics and articles about the dog eaters. And of course, what this did in 1905 and 1909 was show that, look, the Filipinos are not exactly civilized yet. So Americans need to hold on to the territory longer. We're doing, we're benefiting them. Interestingly, six years later, 1915, there are almost no Filipino exhibits like that in San Diego or in San Francisco. Instead, they tended to be much more focused on the, that the education and other efforts were showing promise. Still, not to the point of being independent, but at least they're on the road of, towards that. So the book then, that's where the book comes to inclusion. It looks at these two regions, kind of shows some of the similarities, uh, you know, the emphasis on small agriculture, irrigation, and that, but also I try to, uh, try to emphasize some of the differences. You know, um, San Diego emphasizing uh, a connection to the Southwest and the Panama Canal and larger trade in Latin America, where everybody else is focused more on Asia. San Diego said, no, we're going to look at Latin America and see that is our, is our area of economic prosperity or at least future prosperity. All right, so I do want to leave some time for any questions I have. So let me stop now and I can, I can continue on with this uh, um, if you have any questions about that. So. One thing that uh, we forgot to mention was, for those of you who don't uh, attend regularly, is uh, submit your questions through the, set, uh, the chat function. And then I'll read questions to John. And Steve Lovell is asking, what was the financial and other impacts of the expos to the cities, i.e., did they end up being worth the effort at the time? Yeah, all four expos believe they, and uh, leader, political leaders and business leaders say yes. You know, Portland actually, um, a year or two afterwards, publishes in the newspapers growth records showing new bank deposits, new economic activity. Um, and uh, all of them, I believe, make a profit or at least break even roughly. And none of them are bad losers in a, in a, in a sense of money. Um, so in that case, they do, of course, promote the region. Now, whether, I mean, you're, you're, things are complicated by the fact that, you know, with San Diego and San Francisco, it happens during a war, you know, so, um, and what's interesting about that was that, that this frightened the heck out of the business leaders, because part of the San Francisco was they were going to, they were the international one, they were the true, you know, the nation's exposition. San Diego was kind of a separate regional one. And what they would do, of course, would bring all the other nations in and have them showcase all their goods and everything. And, um, expose themselves to Americans. And then a war breaks out literally six months before they start the exposition. And they're like, oh crap, now, you know, nobody's going to come, this thing's going to collapse. And instead what they did was kind of flip it on its head and said, look, um, not only we're going to show what is so good about the world in a sense, the positives, you know, but they also then emphasize to Americans, hey, you can't go to Europe anymore to vacation. It's in the midst of a war. 
America First, basically it was See America First, it was called back then. See America First was this new campaign that the railroads had started and now San Francisco and San Diego picked up on, you know, since you can't vacation in Europe, why don't you come out west instead? Um, see Yellowstone, see Grand Canyon, you can stop by the expositions on the way. And many of them would go to San, Diego, San Francisco and then head down to San Diego on their way back um, uh, if they had the time. But yeah, economically, they all believe, or financially, they all believe they were successful in terms of bringing new attention to that. Um, the question long term, you know, San Diego, it won't hit the 100,000 mark until the 40s, till the World War. It's World War II that makes San Diego what it is. It's not the exposition. Um, so in that case, it's probably, you know, it's, it's, it lives within the shadows of Los Angeles. Frankly, we still do to this day um, in some ways. So, but yes, they do uh, feel, all four felt that they had been, they were positives at least. Okay. Other questions? And if uh, I'm not seeing anything on the chat, so if anybody wants to break in and ask a question, uh, feel free. I, I remember John talking to a, a fellow whose grandfather had gone to the Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned to him that I really didn't think that the AYPE had really had any long term positive effect. Mm -hmm. And maybe Dan and Carla will jump in and discuss that and dispute it. I don't know. But uh, his comment was, my God, it had a great effect. My grandfather never forgot it. And I thought, wow, well, that's not the effect I was thinking of. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm, I'm not clear. I'm not... Go ahead, Carla. Well, the research that I did, and it certainly wasn't ex as extensive as what's been done for this book, was that there was no effect that it basically was really enjoyed by the people at the time, but that it had no long-term e economic effect. Um, I do have another question too. Go ahead. Um, I was curious, I didn't know that about the Chinese part of the AYP, that someone from Seattle had to go and get that material. Yeah. Can you expand on that just a little bit? Cause that's, that's totally new to me. Yeah, part of what happened was um, that the Chinese, uh, Chinese officials did not feel they were respected by Portland well, you know, because look, you know, they, uh, racism and other things, of course, affected how they looked at China. China was just still not civilized society as they saw it. Like, and Japan was respected. Um, and so they were reluctant to participate in uh, Seattle's also. They did a little bit, but most of it was actually, and I was going to look up his name now, to, you know, you mention it. Um, find it, probably never be able to find it this quickly. But um, one of the local leaders of the Chinese American community said, well, you know, he wanted to have a Chinese impact there. Japan was much bigger at, of course, Seattle. Of course, they had the, uh, the lanterns and all the other um, decorations and the whole, uh, what they call the Jap Alaskan, which is a little, a little offensive, but nevertheless, it's what they called it, um, kind of style. Uh, where, so Japan was much, much larger and influential in terms of how uh, it was portrayed in its participation versus China was a much smaller aspect of that. And my understanding was that, and looking at the records, was it was this local leader. And I'll try to look up his name here in a minute. But While you're looking that up, I'll ask Dan Curley for his uh, assistance here. Dan, your question is, I don't quite understand the ending of it. With so many exemplary cultural, educational, et cetera, features of the expositions that can inspire us today, what is the relative value of emphasizing booster SM today? What is SM, Dan? Maybe maybe John knows, but I don't. Boosterism, maybe you meant, or just didn't get the I in there? Pardon? Maybe maybe, maybe meant boosterism, not just missing the I in the S. Oh, yeah. boosterism today. Okay. So the relative value of emphasizing boosterism today. If you mean emphasizing it today about that event was because um, what I was, as I suggested at the beginning, what I was attempting to try to figure out was how are these Westerners looking at their own place and time? I mean, the book goes in a little more detail than this than I've been able to talk about tonight, but that um, now obviously these, as I said, these were efforts of city leaders. And again, we all have to understand that this, this per perception of the West that they are portraying, they're exporting through their advertising brochures and everything else, 
is a very narrow vision of these mostly business, white business leaders, but they do kind of represent the larger, let's say, most of the population. I mean, if you, I, I think at one point I point out to you, if you would ask the, you know, uh, a Mexican worker in San Diego about the uh, and what the what the fair there was doing, it they wouldn't have necessarily agreed with it, of course. Um, so the boosting part of this, what I was trying to get at was, this is an effort to kind of market and sell. So what are they selling? Because that then tells us what they think is important, um, what is important to them. Um, because part of what's also happening here, and many of you, of course, may be aware, there is this, this sense that in the, at least until the 30s and 40s, until the 40s really, there is a kind of inferiority complex out West, that they're not as good as the East. The East does not respect them. The East is a source of economic power, political power, and cultural power. And the West is a backwater. Um, and here's a chance to say, you know, we live out here. We're not going to accept that. We're going to celebrate the things that we think make us better. I mean, and I, you know, suffrage actually was one of those things. That was part of the reason why women got the vote out West was because it was a show the East that we were better than them because we grant our women the right to vote uh, is, and you don't. So um, this is what I was trying to get at when I talk about the boosterism. Um, I just was fascinated by the, the marketing part of this too and, and how they, um, uh, the various ways in which they tried to package these, these images of their region to the rest of the country. Austin Watson is asking, it seems there are no longer big fairs. True or false? Or has the format just changed? Um, yeah, I mean, there's really, I mean, you still hear about some fairs. They're not very big anymore. I mean, they're not like, I mean, you think about the, you know, the Seattle 62 one, you know, that was one of the latter big ones. Uh, you know, there has been a few others, of course, here and there. Yeah, they're not, they, they don't quite, uh, I think obviously because we are more interconnected as a world, I think that they're not, you don't need to go to a fair and, and, that, and, and they're friggin' expensive to put on now. I mean, uh, you know, who wants to invest in that? I mean, it's like the Olympics and we know the Olympics they all lose money, you know, by God knows by sums and sums of money. Um, but the Olympics have come to kind of the replacement to that to a, to a somewhat extent. But I think that, I mean, this is what's fascinating about the late 19th, early 20th centuries is Rydell also will accept, there's these, every year is almost a fair. You know, there's every year to two, there's a big fair. Um, and then they just die off after the 19, after World War One, And then you see a couple more. San Diego has one in the 30s. Um, yeah. and, and also. Uh, oh. hmm. Tr Trish Hackett, Nic uh, Nicola said that, uh, I think maybe the name we were thinking of, the Chinese fellow who uh, did so much was Ah King. Yes, that's it. Yes, King. He brought the Chinese laborers and acrobat mm -hmm. acrobatic acts over for the AYPE. Right. Yeah, I didn't want to mistake him with Ah Quinn, who was a big San Diego Chinese American leader. And I was ah. like, God, I know that's not the right name. <laughs> King, yes. And uh, let's see. Oh, Lisa is asking, was it Herbert Gowan who brought Chinese items for the AYPE? I, no, it was King, Ah King, who was the, he, yeah, he was the major. Yeah, I don't think right? Herbert yeah. Gowan did anything like that. He was the, he was a UW professor and kind of prominent, but I don't think he, yeah. he did that. Uh, let's see. He did see. give lectures at the AYP about yeah. uh, the Far East. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting too. Uh, Herbert Gowan uh, uh, published a, a paper that, that said that uh, there really wasn't any, any, anti, any serious anti-Japanese feeling in Seattle uh, <laughs> at the time. Uh, the, the, and he was comparing it to San Francisco, but I always thought Professor Gowan was maybe a little, a little too <laughs> positive in that regard. I agree. Yeah. yeah. Um, one of the things I should have mentioned that is a lasting, lasting legacy of the AYPE, of course, is the University of Washington yeah. campus, yeah. which was landscaped by the Olmsted brothers yep, and did, is yeah. still um, really a, a, a long, the most lasting, I think, legacy of any of the things. Mm -hmm. I also wanted to mention that I think uh, one of the last World Fairs that we all remember was the one that was in Vancouver. Yes, I was thinking that's seventy something. I don't, I don't remember the year. I can't remember the year either. Yeah. About eighty-seven. Eighty-seven. Wow, that late. was it. That late. That was recently, and ah, uh, ninety-two. Uh, Spain Barcelona. went along with yeah. the oh, Olympics yeah. with a Euro-centered. 
That's right. uh, feature and with with a fair in Seville. Yeah. Uh, and fair. then there was one, I think, after that, that was truly international uh, in Brisbane. Yeah. Mm. And they're so different than, of course, these these ones from a century ago, which were, you know, uh, you know, the Chicago one, of course, the most famous of them all. Um, you know, they're really a celebration of American greatness in that, you know, they were attempting to showcase what America had become uh, as a rising power in the world, economic and cultural and everything else. Mm -hmm. Sherry Sayer is asking, she recalled there was one in Atlanta. I don't, I don't recall that one, but. 1895, there's a the one where uh, Booker T. Washington makes this, gives mm -hmm. this famous speech, the, the, uh, ec the Cotton Exposition, I think it was called, yeah. I have a question about the advertising. Mm -hmm. um, was there anything like revolutionary about the the approach to print advertising in these Western ones? I, I, they... I don't think I think I, yeah, I don't think there was any groundbreaking. No, I mean, or uh, and that I think it was um, it was showing. I mean, I mean the I think the I think just the variety uh, of, of, the, of the kind of means and that they would they were willing to do. Um, I mean, there are some. I have a, I have a, a couple of paragraphs because I got this from the uh, Portland one, where uh, it was so fascinating. These people would send in unsolicited offers to the expo exposition directors to advertise for them. Give me fifty bucks and I'll put a sign on my bureau and march across the United States with brochures to hand out to people. Um, I think Philadelphia was willing to put a big on a curtain on a screen in a theater with its advertising on it. So, but you had these interesting ones where people, you know, uh, give me $300 and I'll drive across the country uh, in a car uh, and to community to community and become your salesperson in a sense uh, and that. And they would, no, doesn't sound like uh, any of the directors took them up on any of these offers, you know, because uh, I'm not sure if they would ever <laughs> have actually seen any action of them because they couldn't ever guarantee they were going to do it. <laughs> But there were a number of these kinds of things uh, that the uh, offers to, you know, and it kind of shows the kind of, if you want to call it, capitalist spirit of Americans at this time or entrepreneurial spirit that some had that they could make a few dollars off of this also. Trish, you had a question? Um, well, um, I had a comment um, and I put this in the, in the chat, but in uh, 2009, I had a grant to uh, do a website on uh, the Chinese at the World's Fair at the mm -hmm. AYPE. So I, I put the um, address in the chat. It was just a, a small uh, blog that I haven't updated, uh, I but that. you know, if anybody's interested, they can take a look at it. Good, thank you. Uh, I think we have uh, one more comment I was gonna share. Vanessa Chin uh, asked a question regarding Seattle, John, but it probably would be relate to the other cities also. She says, I would argue too, that the growth of Northern Seattle neighborhoods like Wallingford was a lasting effect of the AYPE. Those neighborhoods boomed after the fair due to increased exposure. No, I, sure. I, I, I would probably see that. I mean, I can see that. I'm thinking in San Diego, I can see the same thing. I mean. Um, the area around the park uh, becomes, you know, quite developed uh, in the eastern side. And the western side is, is pretty much downtown San Diego. So um, it also, of course, led to new rail lines uh, that had to service Balboa Park from the downtown, which then were extended into these new, you know, it would then be called suburban developments. We'd still call them almost center city, but uh, um, over the next uh, two or three decades and that, so. Okay. I definitely agree. Yeah. Well, I was telling John when all this started that uh, we usually uh, have these meetings until about eight o'clock, which is important because my wife expects me to have dinner shortly after eight o'clock. But if anybody wants to continue, I suppose we could. Sure, got But uh, probably time to wrap it up. I do want to point out that uh, uh, next month, March 24, we'll hear Richard Heisler, who's going to talk about Seattle's Civil War legacy. Pretty interesting. Uh, you know, when somebody mentioned it to me, I thought, well, we don't have any Civil War legacy. I mean, we didn't fight in the Civil War. So what's Richard going to talk about? But I've talked to Richard extensively, and he's got some pretty interesting things to say about people who came out here after the Civil War mm -hmm. and what their effect was in the Pacific Northwest. So join us on March 24. Glad you could join us tonight.
John. It was a pleasure. Well, thank you. Glad very you much. could join us from San Diego. Yes. Well, I hope everybody enjoyed it and best wishes and see you next month. Thank you very much, everyone. Take thank care. you again. <laughs>